Jenny? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Great. The Jenny Toomey. Here I am. <laughs> there you are. That's so awesome. Um, nice to meet you. Welcome to uh, Jams for Man. Thank you for, for making some time for me on this uh, fine Sunday morning. So is what you're doing a video? something or is it, it i do i do a video podcast mm -hmm. and then i'm taking all these interviews and i'm gathering them together to make a historical archive basically or an oral history of northern virginia music in the 80s and 90s okay i feel like um uh, the scene in D.C. Is, has, has widely been covered in kind of the early 80s, but the Northern Virginia piece has sadly not been um, covered as well as it should have, especially mm -hmm. the, the Northern Virginia scene of the kind of early um, to mid and late 90s. Oh, okay. All right. Of, of so which you were an enormous part. There you go. I mean, I think I, I just lived there for a long time. Well, when, when did you get there? Were you born and raised in Arlington? No, I was born in D.C. Uh, and then, uh, I don't know, like three or four years later, my parents moved out to Chevy Chase and Bethesda, uh, different places there. And I went to VCC. And then I went to Georgetown, so I lived in D.C. But like from my freshman year, I started living in the Positive Force house in the summers. Um, and then after it, I only lived in the dorms for one year. I lived in group houses for the rest of my college. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I think Positive Force house was the first house I regularly lived in, in Arlington. That is fascinating. Um, how did that, how did that come to be? How did that happen? I just was part of Positive Force from the very beginning. Like a lot of the first Positive Force meetings happened at my high school because Kevin Matson was still going there. Um, so, you know, Kevin and Mark started Positive Force. And uh, during my high school years, I regularly went to the uh, Quaker Center or the Peace Center where the meetings were almost every week. And I worked, you know, we delivered Spread to the homeless um, every, you know, that, that was the first thing I, I organized that when I first came um, to Positive Force. And then I just sort of stayed and I was completely consumed by the DC punk rock scene. So moving into Positive Force seemed totally natural. So what made you want to get involved with that as a, a high school student? Uh, I don't know. I think I've always had a pretty, um, I don't know. It, it might've been my upbringing. Like I was, I was brought up with like Jesuit Catholics and, um, you know, I feel like Catholics don't give anybody much to work with <laughs> at this moment, but as a young person, uh, the Jesuits that, uh, that were at the center of the churches I went to were really steeped in kind of um, liberation theology and, um, you know, really clear focus on kind of, again, depending on which priest they were, there's one that, you know, sort of was deeply existentialist and sort of the meaningless and the meaningfulness of life, which was really a great, you know, there's a reason why everybody likes the cure at a certain age or whatever, <laughs> you know, like that, that sense of is life meaningful that feels so acute when you're, when you're young. Um, and then, uh, and then there were other ones that were just very much service focused. So, you know, that's always, I, I did all that before I ever 
got involved in DC punk. And then I was just really lucky because like there were a bunch of bands um, that had members in, you know, BCC. So like Mike Fellows from my spring was at BCC and Natalie Avery and, uh, and Kate Samworth from Fire Party were at D uh, BCC. <laughs> Bloody Manic and Orchestra, you know, and, and members from that went on to be in Dag Nasty. So they were all, you know, and it was a really big high school. So um, folks kind of self-selected based on what they were interested in and less on age, you know. So, you know, there was like a punk what, clash. <laughs> what were the first shows that you saw like out of, was it out of that group or were you even going to shows before that? No, it was definitely when I, I mean, so, well, I mean, it, it was also an interesting school because it was really kind of um, mixed, uh, you know, mixed income at BCC. So, and mixed race. There was a lot of black kids and a lot of white kids and a lot of very elite kids and a lot of kids that came from more struggling, um, you know, economically struggling backgrounds. So it was a night, it was a super interesting mix that way. Um, and there was lots of like go-go, like at our high school dances, there was go-go music. So I probably saw go-go bands before I saw punk rock bands. Um, but you know, like there were folks uh, that played at the talent show. Like I'll always remember when Bloody Manic and Orchestra played at the, at the high school talent show and they were supposed to play like two songs and they were told explicitly they couldn't play their hit cool as shit for the obvious reason because you know it cursed and um we had a like one of those hy hydraulic I think is what you call it stages that so they'd have like some sort of a skit or something and then a band would come up and then the band would go away and they do some other sort of talent thing the talent show nice. and it was, it was so funny because when Bloody Manic or Orchestra had played their song like the blender or something and then uh it started to go down and Alex Mahoney said, we're not leaving. <laughs> and then they said, cool as shit, I got in trouble. And all the punk rockers, and like, this is just in like a, a kind of cushy, nice um, auditorium with like, you know, uh, fabric seat, seat chairs and whatnot. I mean, you know, like the flip up ones. And all of the people who were punk or punk adjacent or mod all ran up to the front and created a pit in front of the very square nice. auditorium. I mean, so like th those are like my first associations to it. And those folks were a little older than me. They had driver's licenses. They would take me to see shows. So, and we would go see like 9353 and Faith and Void and all sorts of bands, uh, whoever was playing a lot of Marginal Man, you know, tons of 9353, Grey Matter, and then eventually Rites of Spring and, you know, Embrace and all those bands. Where did you go see those shows at? Uh... Well, you know, I guess Worst Radio Hall 
for some of them. Um, and I remember an amazing Rights of Spring show at, uh, I think it was, no, a, was it Rights of Spring? I'm trying to think. I, there were some that were food for thought that were incredible. Um, there were some that, I mean, 930 Club, sometimes in DC space, some kind, sometimes. Um, the, you know, there were ones that were at halls, like there was a hall in Bethesda and there was a hall just under Chevy Chase Circle where, you know, bands would play sometimes. Um, but yeah, anywhere. I mean, I, I saw I saw an amazing show at Georgetown before I ever went there, that kind of seminal, you know, beefy to right to spring. Embrace. It was like a perfect show. Everybody played. And in order to go to that show, which was after hours, I stole a permission slip from the high school. <laughs> um, <laughs> from the high school, I, I I did something. I did some sort of service at the high school that got me access to this sort of back room, and I there was one of those like those metal permission slip shaped uh, filing cabinets. So it was like maybe fifty little drawers that were just eight and a half by eleven, and um, I just pulled one of the the masters out, and I told my parents I was going to see Showa because it was the only thing I could think of that was long enough to keep me out late enough for the punk rock show. <laughs> but yeah, so like I, I did my, like my, my disobedience was pretty square and orderly. When did you yourself start playing? Much later. Um, when I was in college, uh, you know, I, I helped a lot of my friends who were in bands, my best friend, Derek, of the time uh, who was in Carpe Diem, you know, I, I think I helped him set up some shows and, you know, like I felt band adjacent, but not in bands. And, um, but then when I was in my freshman or sophomore year, I think it was my freshman year, but it might've been my sophomore year. I was good friends with Dave Grubbs, you know, who went on to play in Gastrodal Soul and, you know, was in Squirrel Bait and Bastro. Um, and he was from Louisville, which had a very similar scene to DC. Like DC had a very small scene, um, largely because we didn't have, like we had a college radio station, but it was out in Maryland and it was more mainstream college radio. So like there wasn't a, there wasn't, like we weren't, we were very inward looking, like, you know, when Mud Honey was selling out way big venues in New York City, they might not sell out in DC because it was much more of an inward looking city than an outward looking city. New Orleans is very similar. And, and I think Louisville has a lot of that as well. Um, and those scenes are really interesting because they don't have, I'll always say this, that they don't have sufficient um, numbers in each sort of pre-baked genre of kind of music. Like there's not so many punk rockers and so many mods and so many, you know, whatevers that you can separate them. So there's a lot of cross pollinization and, um, you know, places like DC space, I would always say, you know, you'd have like 101 black poets on Monday night and on Tuesday night, you'd have something kind of goth and on Wednesday night, you might have like lesbian cabaret, <laughs> you know, and, and everybody was kind of part of the same scene, you know, everybody didn't go to everything, but there was a lot more overlap. And so, when Dave Grubbs came to DC, you know, and we were friends, he just asked me why I wasn't in bands because he knew I could sing. I'd been in all these professional choirs and I hadn't actually thought about it. And once he asked me that, I'm like, oh, that's ridiculous. Of course, I should be in bands. So I told Derek when he came back from college, we should be in bands. And we started playing music um, that summer. I think Geek started that summer and Choke also started around that time Then we went away toward junior year in college in England together. He and I, we did choke the whole time and then came back into geek for a year. So that's that's kind of how I started. That and also my friend, Dan Littleton, also really encouraged me to be in bands as well. And he played with choke somewhat. But even I, before I, that, you're saying you were singing for years. Yeah, you, I was a, a, in a professional- You had gotten a musical part. education. Uh, I guess, I mean, like it wasn't, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't like formal musical training, but it was a really serious choir. So it was like three days a week. And I was in it for two or three years. And we we sang like a huge like repertoire. Was that through the church or was that separate? It was separate. It was called the Washington Children's Choir. And weirdly enough, Amy Pickering from Fire Party was also in it. 
Um, I saw them play uh, a concert at my elementary school, I think. Yeah, my elementary school. No, maybe it was my junior high school before I went to high school and joined them. Um, and she was a full on punk in the choir, which was so strange because it had very young kids to older kids. And she had like black hair and blue fingernails. And that was very unusual at that time. And uh, like, I could see myself judging her, you know, being a kid from junior high school or elementary school and had never seen this kind of stuff before. And then she sang better than anyone. Like she had the best voice, yeah. she really did. She got like a full scholarship to go to college on her voice alone. So um, that was like one of the first moments where I could sort of see the kind of, uh, the really interesting, you know, the way that you didn't have to be, you know, you could be excellent in this totally different way than I could imagine not having been exposed to it before that. But yeah, we sang a lot. But so when you, when you uh, started playing and started doing the band thing, you already had like at least a control over your voice. You had developed your, your chops, so to speak, vocally. You know, it's funny. I think with kids, it's very easy. Like, you don't need a lot of technique when you're kids. You just sort of are mimicking and you've got these elastic neurons and you hear a song once and you remember it immediately. Like, I see that with children all the time. You know, they they really uh, get it. So I, I think we sang in um, four sections and we would mix the sections up too. So, you know, like when you're singing tight harmonies, like you're singing Mozart or you're singing like really, you know, the Vivaldi Amen or whatever, like these very complicated songs. Uh, we'd sing in and sections. You did that? Oh yeah, yeah. That's it. Was all that kind of music. Um, there, there was, there was a, uh, there was a, a huge sacred book which was all sort of the best of this kind of beautiful music, and then there was a Christmas book, and then there was a, um, what do you call? It? What's the opposite of sacred? It's the. It starts with popular. An no, it was like, it's another S word, but it just basically means like more modern music. Popular. We, we would sing Sondheim songs and, you know, and uh, like they would do a, um, like the Mikado or something like that once a year, we would learn sort of a more complicated piece. Uh, and then some of us went away to summer camp for a month and that was a lot more, that was much more like the real training, but like I never did real voice exercises or learned breath anything until much later when I kind of lost my voice a couple of years ago. Mm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it was just like doing it all the time. And I, that's the whole thing anyway. I mean, you know, with punk, if you just play the same chords over and over again, you get pretty good at them. And but you were also maybe comfortable or more comfortable being on a stage performing for people as well. You know, uh, I guess I that I think that's learned, you know, as well. Um, like when you're when you're in a choir, it's hard to feel like anyone's looking just at you. Like you really, I mean, particularly if it's like a forty person choir, you're kind of a like a you're a pack. Um, yeah. So I mean, I think I had some nerves being on stage in the early parts of music, uh, but it goes away. Like particularly because like you feel like you're part of a gang. You know, the really hard stuff is solo. And I don't know, in like 97 or maybe 96 or 97, Jeff Rina and I went on a solo tour together where we played like half the set together and then half the set alone, each of us. Mm -hmm. And it was really nerve wreck. Uh, it was like terrifying for me for the first like three nights. And then you just get over it. So it really is just like a lot of that stuff is just exposure, you know? Yeah. Getting used to the stage. Well, what was the, what was the first time or what was the, the first thing you were performing with? Was that choke or geek or what do you remember like actually either doing a show or, or doing a performance at school or whatever? So... I think Joke and, Joke and Geek were around the same time, you know, and if Derek Denklow was here, he might be better at saying exactly which one. I mean, all these things were happening around the same time. Like Dan Littleton would come visit me 
in, I guess, all right. So geek definitely happened before choke then. And before I started playing with Dan, um, because I think geek was a band at, when the hate it was the band. And I met Dan when we were both bands playing in shows. So it, it could have been choke or geek first. And, you know, it was definitely like either my, yeah, I think it was probably my sophomore summer that we did that. And then choke became more important because we didn't have the other musicians with us. That's right. The first summer we did Choke and we had Ivor Hansen, who was in Manifesto and The Faith and a bunch of other bands, Embrace, um, who played drums with us for that first version of Geek. And then the next summer after after being away for a year, uh, Steve Jackson joined us as our drummer and was, was in the band for that last year. And then we did one tour that summer after our senior year. And you were writing all the lyrics? No, no. Um, with Choke, with Choke, I, I have to go back and look at what's on, on the Choke Seven Inches and what's on the Box X. I, I haven't. I'm I'm dipping back and looking at the old stuff now because Tsunami is working with Numero Group on a box set. So I've been reading all the journals around the Tsunami time, trying to remember what happened. But it's a long time ago for people like me. I was. Or anybody. It's like a forward moving fish. I'm always interested in what's next. Um, so having to go back and remember all this stuff uh, is actual work. <laughs> but but yeah, just let's just say it all happened around the same time. And um, Dan Littleton played with uh, Derek and I in Choke a little bit. He came over to England and played with us for a little bit. And then uh, he played on the record, the seven inch we put out. And he and I got in a band called Three Shades of Dirty after that. And then we did uh, a, a tape together called Slack. And in those cases, in all those records, it's a mix. You know, generally, I think the people who are singing it wrote it in those things. Um, although I would often sing on top of other people's songs, too. I were you writing at this time? Were you, um, you know, taking sort of all the all the high school feelings and all of what you were experiencing in terms of community with um with positive force and and all of that and you know putting that into your your lyrics yeah i mean geek is a pretty political like if you go back and look at the songs they're like you know erasure is about women being erased in language <laughs> and you know um you know, uh, I I did a, a summer job where I worked with youth at risk and a, a lot of songs came out of seeing kids who had some really hard, you know, experiences uh, and seeing the deep inequality of how these kids were being raised. Um, you know, and a lot of questions, I mean, like this was particularly the second geek record was before we graduated college. Um, or the summer after we'd graduated college. So a lot of sort of next step, you know, and sort of rejecting a beaten path, a lot of songs like that. Um, Chris, uh, uh, Lily Daniels, our bass player at the time, ran 
uh, ran an organization for youth at risk. And so a lot of her songs were dealing with that. So like a lot about, you know, the violence and inequality and sexism and racism we were seeing. Uh, and then just like a structuralist critique of like the world, you know, because we were living that. I lived in Positive Force House for like, God, maybe five years or something like that. So, and that whole house was kind of like that every day, you know, no drugs and alcohol in the house, no meat, you know, it was the place where positive force meetings happened. So it was like a center of organizing. There was always, you know, everybody worked at the food co-op. <laughs> like, you know, it was just like, it was every element of that house was, you know, intentional community uh, living through a very political lens, so. Well, I mean, it sounds like you were kind of learning how to sort of shape your life and your community to to affect the world um you know to to do your part like just inside of yourself but then you know uh, in a larger way as well yeah, i mean you know i don't live like that anymore so it's not like i was learning the lesson the lesson <laughs> but i mean i think it really was i mean the 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 cool thing was it really gave you permission to not um live the way everybody else was living you know you you really could make kind of different values based decisions about how you were living and you know intentionally with mixed gender intentionally you know uh, with more people in the house so it was less expensive so there's less economic pressure so people could create art and you know write books and organize and um Etc. All that kind of stuff. So I mean, I, I learned a lot about about that living there, and it, you know, and it was really exciting. You know, you got you're living around people who really care about the world and who are pretty principled and sweet and generous. So it was a uh, it was great, and then creative like putting on shows and you know. It sounds very... awesome. I mean, it sounds a lot better than just focusing on, you know, partying every weekend or whatever, you know, like a lot of kids in high school and college are going to be doing. Yeah, I mean, I, t I totally felt that about the DC scene anyway, just because I mean, I was I was naturally pretty square. Um, so the idea that, you know, you get permission to be to get extra points for being square. <laughs> You know, not a lot of kids get that, you know, you've got peer pressure to be squarer <laughs> in some ways, uh, but, you know, but very open around all, all these other things that you're not square about. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I, I don't know. think being in those bands and, you know, starting these labels and putting up seven inches is particularly square. Well, but I mean, it was around like not prioritizing drinking, you know, or like creating alternative new year's eve events that had nothing to do with alcohol or only playing places that weren't bars or you know all those kinds of things uh were completely counter to normative square we'll just say yeah but that but in a way that's countercultural when you know especially when you're in high school and college so it's com yeah completely completely countercultural it is but yeah but it's also in some ways isolating um, as well, because the world's not like that. So, um, you know, that ultimately it's not where I stayed, you know, and, and I'm sure you could find a dozen people who could say they'd seen Jenny Toomey drinking beers at the bar, particularly as Tsunami took off and we went and played shows all over the place. Um, well, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was great to have a whole bunch of, I mean, they really were like, it's not unusual or it's not weird that we would call our first band geek because like we were kind of weirdos and you know and as much as in retrospect it seems very cool I mean the positive force kids I'll always say were like you know the scene was elastic and all sorts of people could fit into it but like it wasn't the coolest place to be well the, the message also spread because you know I'm I'm from Reston and this is the podcast is called Jams for Man in honor of our shows that we did jam for man at the local community center and the, the high school and everything like that and they were based on positive force shows they yeah. were you yeah, know. know well that stuff is the coolest the just like my favorite thing about positive force was just that when i was really young like when i was a sophomore in high school and i wanted to put on 
the alternative fest at DuPont Circle, you know, and I was not old enough to sign a permit, somebody who was part of the group who was older would walk down with me and sign the permit, you know? So, I mean, that, that was really cool. The intergenerational support and the idea that instead of what we were being told was activism, which is like, oh, we'll get a job over the summer getting signatures for PERG or something like that, which is like soul killing and not very creative at the moment that you have the most energy and the most creativity, like being able to say like, I want to do this. And everyone just coming in saying, all right, well, I can help you do this part of it. You know, you need a car. I can pick up the stage and move it or whatever it is, you know? Well, how did you, when you were doing Choking Geek, how did you know how to record a seven inch? Where, where did you go to record? I mean, I know you later created uh, basically the, you know, the manual for doing it, but, um, but how did you yourself learn how to do that? Well, I mean, in the early days, before we put the guide to putting out records, um, I mean, a lot of it was just word of mouth. You know, you could just talk to your friends who had already done it and they would help you. They would help you and, and everyone would help, you know, uh, Ian and Jeff would help, you know, even more established labels would be helpful. Um, Kristen learned how to lay out the artwork by sitting next to Jeff Nelson and him explaining in detail how to, you know, how to use the amber lith and how to create the layers so you could get the, the three color, um, you know, use the three color breakdown to get more colors and do the covers of artworks. So a lot of it was just people were really generous with their information. Um, I also think like we were a degree of separation from everyone. Like I, I totally forgot this until recently. I saw Alex Mahoney at the 30 year um, Black Cat anniversary mm -hmm. event. And he just sent me a link to all the WGNS cassettes, which were um, cassettes that like people like Colin and Kevin and you know, the, all the folks who are like sort of play mannequin orchestra adjacent at um, at BCC and then like Jeff Turner and some of the folks that were over at Whitman had this sort of name for themselves, WGNS or IPU the, or EPU, that's what it was, which stood for all these different things. And um, they put out these funny cassettes and sometimes it would be like pretty formal like it's just like the bmo one sounds just like a bmo record but some of them would just be these kind of crazy art musicals that were just hysterical or you know bad rap or you know a drum machine or like straight out punk but anyway so um i don't know if jeff turner recorded all of that but he took the name and became WGNS. And it's funny because I totally disconnected before I went back and listened to all those tapes that I had heard when I was a teenager, just the other month, um, I had wholly disconnected that whole phenomenon of those cassettes with WGNS, which was the name for Jeff's um, studio. And we recorded a bunch of stuff with him. Um, I think also like with the early geek, there were two guys whose names I will forget, who just volunteered to record us and who helped us do the first Cowarcade cassette. And they, you know, they just had some stuff in their basement and they did it. So, so I would just say, first of all, how did we learn how to do it? Like we just, anybody who would help us, we just did whatever, you know? And, uh, and sometimes you can tell because that Cowarcade cassette is pretty smashed. But, um, but then later, uh, in order to put the, you can do it flyer out, which was in the positive force compilation album that discord put out and i'm forgetting what the name of it was but there was a booklet in it called you can do it and in that booklet we had like how to put on a show and how to organize an event and how to make a flyer and then there was a how to put out records and we went to our friend steve skrziniertz who had run um had been part of or ran leopard gecko records and meat records and he just wrote up the first version of it. And later, much later, when Tsunami was featured in um, Sassy Magazine, we realized we were going to get a whole lot of press, um, or not press, uh, letters, because all of our friends who had been featured ended up with like a thousand um, letters from girls. And so we 
we reorganized all that information and updated it in the guide to putting out records. So we didn't have to write a thousand letters. So we could just send the guide to all the kids who uh, wanted to start their own record label. So that was why we did it. And then we realized, oh, it actually has a kind of mediating effect on the scene because if we said this is a good distributor, then all these people would send their records to them. And if they were not paying, we would take them off the list, you know? So it was a way of sort of creating best practices in a document that a lot of people were using. So it's a lot of talking. Um, when did um, when did you formally like establish the the label itself? When did Simple Machines come in? Was it was it just to put out those those first records? Because it's basically around the same time, like nineteen ninety, right? Well, yeah, we're trying to figure out those details as well because they're totally not clear. Like Derek Denkla and Brad Siegel and I were at the beginning of it. And I don't know if it was first me and Derek or if it was me and Brad. I've seen documents that imply the same thing uh, or you know, both of those things. Mm -hmm. um, Derek did so much of the heavy lifting in the graphic work and organizing for Geek and Choke and for the first seven inches. And he worked at the NIMH, uh, which had color copiers, uh, not the kind of color copiers that do photo color, but like that do a green pass or a black pass. So those first seven inches like wedge and uh, wheel or not wheel, wheel that was later wedge and um, choke and one of the, maybe screw were ones that like he would, run through the copy machine several times to get the layers. Um, yeah. So he he was very active in the beginning. And Brad Siegel, I think, was the money. I think he gave us the first bit of money, which like was a couple thousand dollars to pay for the first records. And Brad and I were living in Positive Force House then. And uh, Derek was took a year off. So I think he was a year ahead of me, or he took a year off from, from and didn't finish his uh, maybe after he finished college, before he figured out what his next thing was. It was something like that. But anyway, so like, it's all a mush where the three of us were working on those things a lot. And it was very much because no one was gonna put geek or choke out. We had to do it ourselves. So Derek was really active in all of that. And then after a certain point, he decided he wanted to go to law school and, um, and fell in love and moved to New York. And Kristen around that same time uh, had sort of, I think probably just before the summer of 90, Kristen was suddenly in our orbit. Uh, she'd come to a positive force event and then she just became part of the connective tissue of stuff. And she actually like, even though she wasn't in the band, she was one of the people who followed the first tour, which was the wet behind the ears tour, which was geek and seaweed and super chunk for like three weeks all around the country. And a bunch of people like Andrew Webster, who went on to be in Tsunami, and Kristen just followed it because it was so fun. It was like all our friends were going on their first tour. And so people just came to be part of the event. Um, but yeah, after that summer, I think Derek went back to school and she, Kristen stepped in. And, and since then, it's really like all that original history has just totally been erased, um, not intentionally, but just because so much of the discussion then became about two women running a record label and you know and it became more of an established label so like when you look at the press for those first things there was maybe like a dozen things that anybody wrote about or talked about and then suddenly it became with tsunami it became more of a bigger thing but yeah we have to figure that out we have to go back and and put dates on everything and what what do you think sort of like Christian brought to the the table from like between between the two of you that that sort of changed the the way you did things? Kristen and I are incredibly complimentary people. Like we get along really, really, really well uh, and had a, immediately had a short, you know, a shorthand, like our secret language. We could really uh, connect and work together really well. Um, we both are workaholics. So once she moved into the house, the, 
the the uh, positive force house and once we took over there were there was a sort of a dormant kitchen that had nothing working like there wasn't like a working fridge or anything but it had uh -huh. been a kitchen at one point on the second floor which was just like kind of in a hallway and we took it over and made it the simple machines office and um once she was living adjacent to that office and i was living adjacent to her bedroom it was just we worked nonstop. you know we we had day jobs we'd come home we'd stop at the 7-eleven on the way home we'd get a super big gulp and maybe like two of those um frozen fruit popsicles <laughs> and that would be dinner and we would just work into the night you know filling orders or designing artwork or writing letters to people or whatever um so like that that work work collaboration has been really well we also have like a, a really good she's incredibly good at the details i'm sort of good at the big picture like I can, I can see around the corner. I can anticipate things, um, and so we're really complementary um, in how we work together. And I think we like our the pieces we do too. So um, it's always, I always feel like it's 100% better when I'm working with Chris. A, I like to collaborate with people no matter what. I don't ever like to do things just by myself. But um, but Kristen, you know, has been just totally changed my life when I met Kristen, you know, the, the things we were able to do together over the years. And so when did Tsunami start? Tsunami started just after, uh, all right, so that tour ended in the summer of 90. Um, and I met Andrew Webster on that tour when he was, you know, he was like helping Super Chunk. Um, because he had been roommates with Mac in at Columbia. Um, and we started a long distance like relationship, writing letters. And I went and visited him once. And then we just decided he should come and move up. So by the time, I think within, <laughs> within three months, he had moved uh up to the positive force house and he lived with me for a couple months there and then he moved into one of the group houses in dc um and we started we thought we were going to play our first show that new year's eve we got invited by super chunk to come down and play uh a, like a, a new year's eve show with them in max living room but we couldn't learn enough songs in the three weeks <laughs> <laughs> sure. yeah yep. so um so he came and how how did uh tsunami evolve from that so with tsunami um i think the idea of tsunami was like kristen had never played guitar and i had played a little bit of guitar in geek but mostly it was like banging on it with a stick kind of thing <laughs> so, um, I mean, literally banging on it with a stick. Uh, so yeah, so it was kind of a test for us. And, you know, as I mentioned, like uh, Andrew and Mac and Josh had all been in this band called Bricks with Laura Cantrell, who still is a musician as well. And they had a, a kind of strategy for writing really, really quickly. Like they would just say like, oh, uh, you know, this is the week before exam. So we're going to write an entire cassette tape worth of songs about King Zog or something, uh, you know, and they would just write really funny songs uh, just off the top of their head and record them, you know, and they played, uh, they didn't have percussion. So they would like bang on boxes for percussion and, um, I loved it. Like they, the songs are hysterical. They're funny. And, and so we thought like, let's just do that. And I think that's a little bit why some of the early tsunami songs are kind of silly because it was very much like write it really as fast as you possibly can. And a lot of them just carry like one idea, <laughs> you know, like we're just telling this. Um, but yeah. And it was about me and Kristen learning how to play guitar. Andrew played bass. And, uh, you know, and John Pamer had been living at Positive Force House, too. And so we just grabbed him and put him in the band. But it took us more that like we thought we could get 
we could get the songs ready by uh, by New Year's Eve, but we need a little longer. And so I think we didn't really play our first shows until January or February, but it was pretty fast, like, you know, and low stakes. Like I have a weird memory that we played our first show and only played four songs, but none of us can remember what our first show is, so. How your your thinking at that time for how are you going to sort of do this? There wasn't there wasn't any thought behind that. It was it wasn't really intentional. It was just like this is kind of fun. This is you know I'm just creating music with my with my friends and we'll go from there. Uh, yeah. I mean, like. It's, I think it's very hard for people who are younger than us or who didn't live in that space at that moment to understand just how I am unambitious in traditional ways the musicians were. Like um, super ambitious around certain values. Like I really want to write this song. I really want to record it. I really want to play this show. Like absolutely 100% ambitious to achieve that. But like, there wasn't a pathway to a career that was even imaginable for this kind of music at that moment, right? So, so it, it's funny because it's hard to go back and take facts out of your brain or, or you know, unsee like a color and think only in three colors, you know, if you've seen ten of them or whatever. But it really is true. Like there wasn't. There wasn't a path for that, um, and when that was totally it, fine. When you look at it in totality now, it seems like you had an idea of the bigger picture, like you, like you had some pathway to that. But it's just you blazed that pathway, I guess. No, 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 no. I mean, like, so you know, Discord were a model for a record label, or K. You know, like, oh look they make enough money to continue to put out their friends' records. Like, uh, or, you know, when Ken Katkin ran Homestead, like I remember him saying to me once, like, as long as we've got like three records that sell 20,000 copies, we can put out 20 other records or whatever. Like, you know, it was just like, it was just a, sort of a basic phenomenon. I was also exposed a little bit when in my junior year abroad in England to the phenomenon, the music phenomenon over there. Like you really could become a major artist in England differently than in the United States because England is small and it had three Rolling Stone type, not even monthlies, weeklies that came out. And they were constantly competing with each other, which created this kind of like media attention that we didn't have in the United States that covered such a big, diverse type of music styles and geographies. 
um, like MTV was like the first thing that was kind of the center point where you could actually project one idea of music on the whole country at once in some way. Um, but, but in England, those like Melody Maker, Enemy, and I can't remember what the last one was called, Sounds, um, would be competing. And so you could really be like a no one. And two months later, with these three magazines writing about you, they, you could get like a, in the top 10, you know? And they also had like Peel, which is a radio station, you know, John Peel station was available across the entire country and he had a more eclectic taste. So there were, you know, there were places where I saw weirdo music getting a different kind of scale of attention. And I saw the way that, that Sub Pop expertly um, utilized that, you know, sort of media churn in England to reflect back a kind of power and fame on their artists in the United States. Like they, they, they were doing that in real time with like Mudhoney and Nirvana when I was going to school there. Um, but yeah, you know, it was, unless you wanted to sign a major label deal, you know, over there you could stay on one of these indie labels and still have that level of fame um, because it was, it was smaller. You know, you didn't have to have the kind of relationships that would get you into tower record stores or onto mainstream radio stations. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think I'd seen some of that stuff, but the idea, like my, had my ambition been to be more of a professional musician or to have like a successful label that I could sell to a major at some point, though, like those were all paths we could have, we could have taken, but were just totally uninteresting to us. So. Now, did did those ideas change in the post Nirvana kind of world? Did it change after, you know, 91, 92? Eventually they did because um, once, once there was a moment, and it was probably not just right after Nirvana, it was later, uh, it was a little bit later than that. Um, because you know the phenomenon, uh, the, the phenomenon of of Nirvana seems like it's like a fixed dot. Um, that as soon as they emerged, they took over the world. But that wasn't true. It was years, you know. Like I think they didn't sell out the nine thirty club the first time they came. You know, like the, you know, they had an arc like anybody did. But um, but what happened was once once there was this success and this interest in this area. What had happened was there were these two parallel economies and you had the major label economy and the independent label economy. And there were some genres where people were trying to get into there more often, but like for whatever reason, I think it was because of the countercultural phenomenon of what was happening in punk rock, it wasn't seen as attractive enough. But when some things crossed over, um, suddenly you actually had to compete with them for the same talent. And also people were thinking about it differently. They suddenly had an imagination in their imagination, like, oh, that's a pathway for me. So I'm gonna make some different choices to make sure I get on that pathway. So I wanna know who's my agent. Like, I'm gonna make sure that I record my music in a way that sounds you know, palatable. You know, I, I'm going to um, pay for, someone to promote my music to radio. And so suddenly a lot of attention, uh, you know, a lot of mental cycles and hours of the day are focused on things that are pretty boring. <laughs> um, I mean, really, and, and also, whereas beforehand, you know, if you were pretty good, you know, the college radio stations would play you, but then once the major labels were, you know, seeing the college radio stations as a means of the first layer of promotion for their major label bands, like suddenly you're competing with all of this money. Um, so it, uh, it just, it just became a different phenomenon. And I also felt like, um, you know, like there's this moment when kids are amazing before they get caught up in like what culture, what they think, like sort of the peer pressure, what they think culture, you know, what's pretty, what's ugly, what, you know, all those kinds of things. 
And there's a way that kids just show up with so much openness and craziness and creativity and confidence. And then they're just totally beaten down if they don't fit a pretty narrow set of, you know, indicators <laughs> about what they should be like. Um, and I think that kind of did that to music too. Like, and I think when those kids experience that, they become insecure or they become, they become, you know, they try to model what they think is successful and they become less interesting, I think, for a period of time. And for most people, I think that's just, they grow out of that, you know, they get to a place where they find their people and they grow out of it. Um, but yeah, that's what it felt like to me at that time. Like suddenly all these insanely interesting people were focused on a lot of stuff that wasn't that interesting to me anymore. But you were trying to hang on to that. No, that's when we, that's when we, pretty quickly, that's when we decided we wanted to close the label down. Mm. You know, you know, like uh, we knew we were going to close the label down at least like a year, year and a half before we closed it down. But a lot of it had to do with, I mean, there were two things. One, Kristen had fallen in love and was living in Philadelphia um, and getting married to Brian Dilworth, the wonderful Brian Dilworth. So the idea of how we would run this remotely between two cities wasn't that simple, but also that like it became so expensive to put out records and we were responsible and accountable to our friends. So we had to stay home to promote their stuff or, you know, to package them up. Like we had to, we had to stay home more then the early days when we could just tour all the time and when we toured all the time, we made the most money. So we made the most money. We sold the most records and, and we got paid. Um, but when we couldn't do that, we had to get day jobs. So we were spending all this time with day jobs, you know, like me working at Kinko's and Kristen working at like bagel shops and stuff. And then uh, just barely making ends meet. And that all of our attention was being dragged towards these like radio promotion, you know, other kinds of things. And then also, you know, like in an environment where everybody's getting a deal, you feel kind of like a chump if you don't get a deal or you feel like, oh, well, maybe I'm not cool if I don't get a deal. So it just, it just changed all the incentive structures for everybody. And it didn't seem that punk anymore. Early on though, when, when you guys were, were first going kind of hot and heavy, especially with the like compilations, how did you find some of these other bands? I mean, were were these, you know, bands like Velocity Girl and Bratmobile and you know Holy Rollers and the 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 bands that were on a lot of the initial comps? Did they come to you? Did you reach out to them? I think we all played with each other all the time, and if we ever liked a band, we'd ask them to you know for a song um so i think we asked a lot but sometimes people asked us um i think only once did we ever put out anything that came as a demo tape we got like thousands of demo tapes and we responded to them all over the years but um it was only daniel howell and and it wasn't just the demo tape uh we saw we got to see her live when we toured and she was so amazing we decided to put a record out with her but almost all of them were people we had either toured with, played a show with, were friends with before they started the band. I also like the um, the the Neapolitan Metropolitan, like that comp. Was was that was that your idea to put the like bands from the the three different cities out like that? Yeah, I don't. I really don't remember. I mean, like that's just a that's like a real. Kristen Jenny special there in the sense that um, we always add a little extra. Like we think, oh, should we do this? Oh no, let's do this too. Or let's add this other thing. Wow, I wonder if we did it this way. So like everything down to like the getting Ben and Jerry's to donate, you know, um, spoons <laughs> that we could put in, you know, like all, every like level of detail just happens as we're sort of whipping ourselves into a frenzy um it's just so clever and it's so awesome yeah well you know and it was it was exciting to get to work with some groups we didn't see as much like the virginia bands were you know we'd only seen a couple times the, um, the richmond bands yeah 
Yeah. But, you know, and that was also, that was a benefit for our friends, Yvette and Jen, who had started, uh, you know, I can't even remember the name of the organization, but it was also working with Youth at Risk in DC. Yeah, con continuing to help out the, the community. There was just a lot of that, we, you know, that was the very positive force thing where you're always sort of tithing, you know, you're always raising money or raising awareness. And that's, always, that's just a piece of what we always tried to do. So when the, when the label finally shut down, um, is that when you started um, focusing more on, on solo stuff? So when the record sh label shut down, um, I was focusing on, I don't know, did, when did licorice end? I, I don't, <laughs> I, mean, <it's>, I, <laughs> I am such an untrustworthy <laughs> narrator for this stuff. Um, uh, you, were, you, know, you were saying that you started, you played the first time like sort of solo around 97 or something like that. Well, no, I did. I did a tour called Solo S O L O W, because okay. uh, because they were pretty bummer songs, and they were and Jeff writes some good bummer songs to Jeffrina, and and it was an attempt to learn how to play solo. Um, and it was interesting. Like I said, I I after a couple of shows, I was no longer afraid to play solo. I could absolutely do it. Um, but I also learned I just don't enjoy it anywhere near as much as yeah. I enjoy playing with other people. Um, but, but you yeah, put out like a couple of amazing solo albums. Well, there was Licorice, which which was probably near the end um, or overlapping for the end, which was uh, on 4AD, and it was Dan Littleton and and Trey Manny and I. Although originally, I guess it was Rob Christensen played in that for a little while as well um and, and was that for a d connection from your time in in um over in the uk or no was it, it was actually from um from my my friendship with mark robinson that uh you know unrest was on 4ad and uh ivo i believe was interested in putting out grenadine but we didn't want to put out grenadine we wanted to keep grenadine ourselves and so i sent him a demo of dan and i playing music together and he um he liked it and he let us record an album with warren de fever Mark Robinson and I, I interviewed Mark uh, as well, um, who also had his own label with with Teen Beat, um, and was was there a lot of crossover during that time? Like in Virginia, I mean, it's basically, I mean, you guys are all located in Arlington, essentially. It's, yeah, you know, and and the focus of of this podcast is more about Northern Virginia than, than DC. So it is really interesting and unique that you have Simple Machines, Team Beat and Discord all with places in, you know, in Arlington, uh, Northern Virginia. Yeah, well, and also like, I think Team Beat had at least two houses and and Simple Machines had two houses beyond the Positive Force house where we first 
worked. So yeah, we stayed in that area. I mean, I think the benefits are just obvious. Um, they're freestanding houses where you can practice. You know, there are basements that you can practice in. Um, it was insanely sleepy back then. It's funny because it's like a very expensive neighborhood to live in now. Um, people buy, you know, Sears houses for like $500,000 just to tear them down and build other houses on the plots of land because they're near good schools and whatnot. But it was insanely sleepy back then. It was kind of a mixture of ex-military and immigrant families. Um, the entirety of the main corridor of, you know, Wilson and the other main boulevards was all just like all different kinds of Vietnamese food and Thai food and, you know, burritos and, you know, and all sort of first generation immigrant, you know, restaurants, nothing fancy um, for most of the time that I lived in Arlington. Um, and the street lights would blink yellow after Sears had closed. So like at nine o'clock at night, there what, you know, you would drive the main drive and it would be up to you to just make sure you check both ways before, you know. So, um, so it was very different. It was very safe. It was insanely quiet. I don't think I had a key ever for the positive force house. I don't think the door was ever locked. Um, it may have been similar in, in the first civil machines house as well too. Um, but yeah, it was super, super safe. Um, and easy, you know, like you had a yard, you know, you had a driveway where you could get six cars <laughs> if you need to, you know, like the fact that people were there was just, it was obvious why that was the case. Um, and I wonder, there's so many great bands in DC now. I wonder how they manage it because it's such an expensive city to live in. Um, you know, it was just, it was like a 15 minute ride without any traffic to go to DC space from Arlington where we lived. And it's probably, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour at rush hour easily now, you know? So it, 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 it didn't feel separate. You know, like, I know you're calling us the Arlington people and we were, but like, we spent all our nights at the Black Cat in DC. We weren't really hanging out at um, the Bardo or stuff. I guess, I guess Amdo was a kind of cool little space and they had some shows every once in a while, but there wasn't, you know, and I guess uh, then there was that really cool one that opened up in the building next to where the Sears used to be that a, bro a brother and sister lived, but that was more like alt country and that was much later. But yeah, so like, you know, it, it all felt like one scene to me, you know? Yeah. Was there, was there any competition at all between, you know, the, the, the labels? But to, I mean, I know, I know you got help from, from Discord initially um, to get started. Was there ever, I mean, even like friendly, like kind of just for <clears throat> who could essentially put out the, the, the best, you know, the best bands, the best, uh, the best stuff, not necessarily like sales numbers, but, you know, just, um, or even like who was going to put out what? No, none. There's absolutely none competition, kind of totally an, an anathema to uh, anathema to like what we stood for, you know, at a certain, like we put out the first Lungfish record at a certain moment, Lungfish got big enough that it made more sense for them to be on discord. Were we mad about that? No, it was great. Hooray. They have, they have a better <laughs> label who can, who can give them better reach and put out more records and make sure they kept, they're kept in print. You know, when we were closing our label down, two of our bands were looking into major label things, um, Ida and Scrawl. We were always like, that's great. If you want to go there and if that's going to, if they're going to do a better job, that's wonderful. Um, so no, I didn't have any of, any of that feeling of competitiveness at all. 
I think there was one moment where there was a band we wanted to put out and it was when we were working more directly with Southern Records and Southern said that they would put out this record on Simple Machines if we could get them to sign for three records and they didn't want to. And so they went to uh, Team Beat and that was fine. You know, they didn't want to sign for three. Southern didn't want to put it out unless we were sure we'd have three chances to make back the money. Okay, so they go someplace where they're just doing one. So, and and by the way, we're all friends. Like all those people, like, you know, Mark and Dan and the Scrawl ladies and- so Believe we, me, that's what I always hoped. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's, it's really true. Yeah, you know, we were all friends and like things like, you know, we put like the lots of pop losers thing together in like four weeks just by calling saying, let's do this. And you pick your bands and we'll pick our bands. And there was no fighting about who plays first, who plays last. Like we were so egalitarian. Like Kristen reminded me for our working holiday, no, our final, I think the final event that we played, we didn't want to make anyone have to play first or anyone have to play last. So everyone had to be there when the event started and we picked names out of a hat. So you didn't know if you'd be playing first or last, uh, it, it was kind of crazy, you know, that kind of like whimsy, <laughs> you know, and also not playing to anybody's egos, you know, and sort of leaving it up to chance. Now, do you, do you think any of that is like from female energy? Ah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, again, like I'm, if I, if I'm saying that I'm not competing, going just back to your earlier question, that I'm not competing with Discord or Teen Beat, like I don't think we were sweeter to our bands than they were. Um, I think also like that thing, that thing about like, we're just going to pick it out of a hat is kind of like this kind of extreme egalitarianism that is, goes beyond natural logic in some ways, which is very similar to like, like, you know, Fugazi playing at DC space for $1 and 99 cents. So that, you know, or like maybe it was just 99 cents and Ian in the doorway, handing people a penny, you know, as they walked in, you know, or like Mark Robinson, you know, doing an annual um, like teen beat dinner every year. And with all of this sort of, what do you even call it? Like there's traditions associated to it with individuals at the tables singing acapella songs for everyone. And like, you know, it's, it's just, it's, I don't know. It's just like, it, it tickles us. So we're doing it, it you know? So I don't know. I mean, I, maybe, I mean, we certainly had more women on our label than some of those labels, but not necessarily Mark. Mark, you know, is a huge fan of women's music. I don't know. I really, I really can't say. I, I can say we were definitely a feminist entity. Um, and if you compared us with, I don't know, some of the more traditional punk stuff, we would be bringing a lot more feminine energy <laughs> than that. But DC was a kind of unusual scene, you know, not perfect, but it had different norms, I think. I guess I'm just trying to, to find out sort of what that feminism, how that may have differentiated you over time. How did that, you know, how did that affect the label? How did that affect the bands? And how did that affect the audiences? I mean, it was definitely unusual when we started. Um, like when, when Tsunami did our first tours, we always intentionally tried to play with bands that had uh, women in it. But, you know, we once we got out of the major cities, we'd often run into, um, you know, large pockets where we wouldn't see another woman on stage for a week or so. Um, I mean, so some of it was just that we were doing it. We also talked about it, you know, we'd write about it, make jokes about it. 
Uh, the lyrics were, you know, super feminist, you know, and very much um, in an environment where women aren't on stage, you're kind of getting one side of the story a lot of the time. Um, I had an interview the other day where somebody said like, oh, I don't want to get on Jenny Toomey's bad side because, you know, I would have these songs where I would call out. <laughs> yeah. Sweethearts, bad behavior, people, you know, who I think were being jerks. But I thought like, you'd never say that about a guy. Like a guy could like, you know, scorched earth. And they're just like, ah, he's just expressing his feelings. <laughs> you know. So I don't know. I don't know. I, it'd be interesting for someone else to to say that, you know. We always felt very feminist and uh but also like there was a real structural critique, like the last record, Brilliant Mistake, is a lot about, you know, why is everyone chasing this shiny thing? It you could see around the corner what was gonna happen. Um, you know. And then just sort of the unfairness of living in a country that doesn't really respect art. You know, you go to other parts of the world where people actually could, if you had health insurance, you know, <laughs> um, or some kinds of subsidies, it would be easy to be an artist. But here, so many of the the folks I know who gave up, gave up because for financial reasons, there was no way to sustain it. So. Well, you have been involved with the, the Future Music Coalition. Do you... Do you think that that has changed a lot since since that time? Do you see big differences in our society and for women in music now? I think it's gotten worse, honestly. Um, you know, I started Future Music because we had a guide to putting out records, and um, I, I, well, I, I've been dragged into working on policy advocacy with Michael. Bracey, who was one of the co-founders of Future of Music Coalition. Um, you know, before that I'd been an activist, but a lot of it was like sort of the, the stick as opposed to the carrot side of things. More about, instead of advocating for a specific policy, often advocating against a bad behavior or protesting, right? Um, and, which is interesting because I'd lived in DC, I'd been right around, you know, these entities where you can just walk right through the door and go into Congress talk to your representative, but never had really thought about that stuff. Um, and then Michael Bracey, who had gone to Georgetown with me, recruited me to help him organize musicians around this moment of opportunity uh, that was happening at the Federal um, Communications Commission, where some of the extra spectrum could be made available for low power radio licenses. And it would be the first time where you'd put new small radio stations all over the country. And and uh, so we did, we started Future of Music uh, for a couple reasons. One, because in that work around low power radio, I realized like how the market concentration of radio had really fucked up radio for everyone. That mm -hmm. the allowed consolidation had Great. really stolen most of the diversity of the radio off because the people who had, you know, eight radio stations in a market would program them at a very small degree of separation from one another. So you'd have like, I'll always say like, you'd have light rock, heavy rock, mom rock, you know, teen rock, and all of them would be playing, you know, Hotel California at some point within a 12 hour period. So it was like the same handful of songs that were being played with just slight tweaks so that when you turned off the radio station to another station, you'd land on another one they also controlled that was just within the same pattern. So instead of having what you could have had, which was like eight completely wildly different stations or like what community radio did, gives, which is like, you know, totally different hour to hour, you know, radio stations serving all different kinds of communities, all that kind of stuff went away because those stations who had been doing that at scale kind of sold their licenses and so we, um, I, I, I began to get more of a structuralist critique where it wasn't sufficient just to be mad. You actually could argue for a better system. And so I, I started doing that with Michael Bra uh, Bracey and I grabbed Kristen Thompson who was doing her master's degree at that point in public policy. And I said like, let's try to put a guy to putting out records in this digital environment and see if we can recommend better and worse things and also if we can have that same kind of influence that i mentioned that we had with the paper guide where 
you know, we could say, oh, it's always bad to take the copyrights. Like you can never buy the copyrights. You should only license them or, you know, whatever, whatever the, there were so many different models. Then there was like 60 models and some were like, you own your own, some of them, you license them, some of them, you sell them, some of them are streaming, some of them are downloads, you know, some of them have watermarks. There were all these different things that people were competing. And as we were trying to design this and we had like interviewed hundreds of people and we had this guide that we had on the web called the machine and we had check marks saying like, this is better and this is worse. And then the market collapsed and like the most radical ones were purchased by the most, um, like by the most extreme major label <laughs> characters um, or were just put out of business. And we realized like, oh, it's not enough to recommend you know what the vehicle is for music we have to advocate for better systems and so i spent seven years doing that um before i went to ford um but what i feel like has happened i mean there's all sorts of wonderful things that have happened like you've seen what a bad memory i have so it's exciting to me that some people have recorded tsunami and grenadine and other things and put them on the web and i can go back and see things uh or releases that i didn't put out or i don't have copies of there, I can probably find them on YouTube and it's efficient to be able to listen to music, you know, where you don't have to take an entire wall and fill it with records. Yeah. Um, so all those things are as a consumer of music, I like it, but I don't think it's made music more mysterious or valuable. I think some people do that. Um, like there are people who buy every single Numero release because they're so beautifully put together and, you know, um, they are elevating the value of the physical, you know, artifact in a way, but they seem to be like, you know, and, and there is a phenomenon of the re-releasing of vinyl. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but um, it, it, I don't know that people think of You know, you don't have the, the, there was something about the limitation that made you actually pay more attention to the music. So, you know, you could only, you didn't have enough money to buy every record. So you would buy some records and then you would listen to those records carefully and you might not like them first. And then you might actually get a sense of what was happening with them. And then you might fall in love with this record in a way that you might not now because it's just one song streaming across your intelligence. And then I also think that we're being trained to believe that the world has to be like it is like this capitalist way that it is. And so like when people say, Oh, they're going to fire all these lawyers now because chat GPT can do everything that lawyers could do with regards to contracts. They're probably better at looking at contracts and saying, okay, this is what was in this contract. This is what's missing from it. And here's a legal explanation about what's changed and what's good and bad about that. Yeah. And I see people saying, well, you know, that's just, that's what's progress. That's what's happening. You know, we're just going to get rid of them. Um, but you never, ever think about what's lost when the human component of these, and first of all, like what's lost in society when you have extreme precarity, because there's only a handful of people. That's who make assuming money. that lawyers are human. I'm just kidding. <laughs> joke about that. There, dad, there are people who are arguing capital my cases. My dad was a one. lawyer. My uncle was a yeah, lawyer. The, tell me what the world would be like without a civil rights act you know i mean you know it's not perfect but you know the idea that we're going to get rid of all of the imagination lawyers and only have you know automated tactical lawyers seems really scary to me like this conversation around like oh well those writers should just get over it you know like of course the companies need to be able to use automated systems to write their scripts and to you know they should be able to populate, you know, with digitally created humans acting or whatever all this stuff. And, and there's this kind of sense, like, it's almost like it's déclassé to say, isn't this, isn't this just like evil and awful <laughs> that we're replacing ourselves in these ways? Like, I don't know. I mean, they're, they're, I'm not completely against these technologies, but I think it's interesting that people are just so ready to throw away humans you know, towards a theoretical efficiency. Like GPS gets me lost and it's been around for 20 years, but we're just like allowing much more sensitive things than whether we can drive on the roads, you know, 
to be in the hands of completely untested technologies that are unregulated, that are non-transparent, you know, that are only built for business incentives. So I would just say like the musicians were the tip of the iceberg for this. We were the first ones. And I felt it acutely because I saw very, like some of the most brilliant musicians the only difference between famous ones and not famous ones was like the attention that they were able to get a lot of time. And so it became a don't quit your day job versus a genius when these were the exact same people, you know? How do we get back to a situation where, you know, where people value the intellectual component of it and people value, you know, not just the physical uh, artifact of it, but they value the music itself. Yeah, it's, and I- and We've, I, we've I, gotten away from, from, we've gotten away from valuing it. I, and I don't know, There, there's probably all sorts of magical, wonderful things that are happening. Um, so I don't want to be a like it was so much better in my back in my day, but no, I, just, I, I don't want to be man shouts at cloud either. But yeah, but it it, it did it did feel like um, you know, and there are wonderful people still doing stuff. So I'm not saying that, but there is something where I just feel like there's it's I think it's a lot more disposable than it was. You know, and, yeah. and it also could just be age, like at a certain moment in your young life, it, these music means so much to you. Um, I think that's probably still the case right now. I don't know. Um, I just, I just feel like, so going against like whether the way it's presenting itself now and then is better or worse. What I will say is just like, I don't feel like musicians are more respected now than they were. There's a handful of them that are. There are some that have managed to navigate the system and have some control. Um, and that seems great. But yeah, I, th I think even really, really, really remarkable musicians are having a terribly difficult time. And a lot of that also has to do with like how expensive it is to live and how expensive it is to drive and all of these other things, you know. But you were also saying that it's not just all musicians. You were saying in particular for women, you feel like it has gotten much worse. I don't know if I feel like it's gotten much worse for women. I think actually it's gotten better for women in some ways because it's normalized that women are supposed to be on stage, whereas beforehand it was a phenomenon. Um, you know, like all the girls rocker camps and all these sort of like, you know, all these inspiring uh, like all the bands that I saw at the Black Cat, and I guess that's probably I'm self-selecting for someone who has this similar taste to me, but like all the bands had women in them and, you know, all totally mixed and, you know, joyful, happy, uh, like egalitarian bands where, you know, when you see something like um, we saw the bad moves, they were so great. I'd never seen them before. And you know, the, 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 you know, the diversity, the youthful joy and the sense that they're, they're coming at it without, like, there doesn't sound like there's any edge around it. Like there's not an edge where I'm like, I'm doing this against the norms. Like, it feels like there's a permission that didn't exist before for, for women. Um, I think that's a hundred percent true. I just feel like I don't know that people respect. I just don't understand why why we are listening to the heads of these tech companies um, and allowing them to design the entire world that we have to live with them. Um, you know, so much of the world that we lived in before was disintermediated from these tech systems. So they weren't solely built in a world of commercial incentive, right? All of the systems were working in or were built on a commercial incentive, but like going to the library where I found the image for the cog that I used, um, that we used for the Simple Machines logo. <laughs> you know, there were so many, almost all the interactions of the early part of my music life had nothing to do with the commercial incentives, you know?
Uh, let's start a little sound check. So it's called 460. 